Sure. Good to have you here. Um, this is a, uh, has been a time of, of intense activity in the U.S.-Mexico relationship over the past few months. We could certainly cite um, not only President Obama's visit to Mexico, but actually two meetings between President Obama and, and, and President Calderon. He was, uh, one was before the inauguration during the transition period, President-elect, um, but uh, two visits that, that have happened between those who are now the presidents of our two countries. We could cite the visit of Secretary Hillary Clinton, Secretary Napolitano, Attorney General Holder uh, to Mexico, as well as several reciprocal visits here by Mexican cabinet members. Um, at least by our count, five congressional delegations that have gone to Mexico um, in the past uh, few months since February, which is probably more than has happened in the past three or four years combined. Um, this has been a time of intense activity in the relationship between Mexico and the United States. We want to ask today, we have some very distinguished panelists. We have actually three panels. This will be an opening panel that ventilates some issues, gets them out on the table, and then we're going to, to get into the issues in greater depth, talking about has something changed qualitatively? What's going on? Why is this happening? And what else is needed? What, what else has to happen for some of the commitments that have been made on both sides to be reality? Um, this will be an interactive conference. This is really a set of round tables. Um, there are no prepared speeches. Um, and the idea is to go back and forth a little bit among panelists and hopefully we'll have time to open up to the audience as well to have this conversation. Um, you have everyone's bios, so we're not going to really introduce our panelists. Let me just say we're, we're very pleased to have Ambassador Arturo Sarocan with us, who represents uh, Mexico in the United States, um, but, it, but it also has a, a long distinguished career and, and deep involvement also with the Wilson Center, we're proud to say. Jose Antonio Fernandez and Roger Wallace also have very long resumes which you can read in their biographical information. But for purpose of today, let me say that we're very proud to have them as the co-chairs and the founders of the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute. Um, and can I ask people who are members of the board of the, the Mexico Institute to raise their hand, actually, by the way? Half the audience. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> we're very pleased to have with us, uh, our, the board will be meeting tonight and tomorrow morning, so very pleased to have all of you here. You will hear from many of the board members shortly um, on the other two panels. And we're very proud to have Phil Bennett um, of the Washington Post Company and Raul Rodriguez, um, who are moderating the next two panels. Well, let, let's dive right, right in here. Um, a lot has happened in the past uh, few months between the United States and Mexico. More, I, I don't think President Obama thought he was going to be dealing as much with Mexico as he has been. I don't think President Calderon thought he would be dealing with the United States quite as intensely as, as he was over the past few months. So maybe we can ask the ambassador to open up with a few thoughts. Has something changed qualitatively in the relationship? Do you have a sense that something changed, did something expand, and, and why did this happen? Why all this activity all of a sudden? Well, I think, I think part of it, Andrew, is, is a logical, um, it's a logical sequential process um, as a result of heightened attention on the issue of drugs and thugs, um, which didn't happen yesterday. It's been going on for at least two years since President Calderon decided to uh, roll back and shut down organized crime operating on both sides of the border. Um, and in a certain way, I think uh, by the time President Obama, um, then first as president-elect and, 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 and then as president, sort of stepped in, he realized that despite the fact that Mexico and U.S.-Mexican relations had not been a top issue uh, during the campaign, that he suddenly was faced with the challenge of uh, uh, dealing with a critical relationship for, for the United States. And I think that what was also apparent was that both he and his team were immediately seized of the importance of the bilateral relationship, of investing political capital in the bilateral relationship. And I think that this, is expla this explains why he decided as president-elect, despite the fact that there was a decision not to see anyone before he was sworn into office, to see President Calderon, and then why we saw the flurry of high-level visits uh, in the early part of the year, and then the president's decision to um, visit Mexico besides his trip to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I think that he and his, close, his, his team in the White House are fully cognizant of the importance of this bilateral relationship, not only in terms of drugs and thugs. I think they, day in and day out, are, are uh, convinced that there is a much larger, broader agenda a more holistic agenda, which they will have to deal with uh, for, for not only in terms of uh, U.S. diplomacy, but also in terms of the economic and social well-being of Americans. Okay. 
Jose Antonio, I guess, does it feel to you like there's been a change in the relationship? And, and what else, the ambassador mentions this holistic relationship, what else should be on that agenda besides the drugs and thugs piece, besides the security challenge, which yeah. is clearly well, something I, for both of us? I think, Andrew, that um, it's, it's been the conjunction of fortunate issues also. I agree completely what the ambassador says about uh, what comes from the past two years. But one very important thing that I think the uh, American, new American authorities are seeing is uh, Mexico's authorities are being proving to be effective on the, the, the drug war, which didn't happen before. They are right now seeing that we can prove that we would uh, be acting and operating against this problem, not because not from the rhetoric, political demanding we need help, we need help. We are doing it, even without help or whatever. We are really doing it. The government of Mexico and the army of Mexico has been doing what uh, hasn't, uh, we haven't seen in, in maybe six or ten years of, of, of really operating and working against this, this very negative and big problem. So that, that is helping um, that everybody is starting to look to this relation. But if we see it on the positive side, we, we, we proved with this other swine flu issue that uh, Mexico was not a fallen state, like some crazy guy said. Uh, honestly, and we proved that we behave much better than many, many countries in the world with a very, very problematic, very dangerous, very damaging uh, issue to Mexico. And we sacrifice all our tourism, all our beaches, which are devastated with no, no visitors today because we thought it was, nobody knew how bad was this one's going to be and acted with high responsibility. That, that's a second fortunate issue for the image of authorities in the United States, I think. Now, the third thing uh, that I would mention is we, there is a lot of hope, and we should focus on this issue of, of drugs and thugs, but we should also focus on a lot of opportunities that are in the complementation, uh, complementary issues between Mexico and the United States. And I will mention three things that I think we, we could... Uh, work for the future. First is alternative, uh, alternate energies. There is a lot of opportunities for both countries. We need each other. United States has big energy problems, and Mexico also. We should work together. We have to work together for them. It makes sense to work together on those two things, on, on energy. Second, there is a lot of health issues also. Health could be a, a very interesting issue for, for Mexico to provide health services at a tenth of the price with the same quality to the United States. Mex United States could save a lot of money with health yeah, being uh, sur uh, supplied in, United St in, in Mexico. And the third is education. Y you can tell the, the uh, I rep I've been in Monterey Tech uh, board for the last 15 years and we are exporting engineers like crazy to the United States, no more countries than the United States. And you can find Mexican engineers from Motor Tech anywhere in the United States today. And, and uh, we used to have American girls, beautiful girls, during the summers for years and years at Monterey Tech. Now, no, we don't. We have all kind of, of people from the United States not only coming to Mexico to learn Spanish, but to study uh, engineering, to study a lot of things in, Mon in Monterey Tech. So the exchange in education is also going to help a lot. Uh, to grow and, and develop this uh, relation with, between both countries. Great, thank you. Anyone from Monterey Tech here, by the way? It's a fairly good contingent in Washington, D.C., so, okay, great. Okay. Roger, let me ask you about the foundations for, for the cooperation that's going on. I mean, clearly a lot has happened in the past few months, but did some of the foundations happen for this beforehand? Has this been a natural outgrowth of some of the, the collaboration that's been developed over time? Well, you know, I was thinking coming up here that uh, the sort of dynamics of our relationship, our bilateral relationship, seem to repeat themselves uh, at the beginning of either one or both presidents, uh, going back perhaps until Jimmy Carter. I, I know they got off to kind of a difficult dynamic with, I guess, President Echeverria. But if you look at all of the other uh, presidents, uh, the rhetoric, the, fe the good feeling, the new start, everything sort of uh, evolves. And then traditionally in the past, something has superseded Mexico on the U.S. agenda, and everything kind of goes back to square one. But it doesn't go back to square one, to your point. Uh, there have been a series. Uh, square one gets higher and higher and higher. And 
Uh, those of you who are in the room here followed Mexico for a long time can probably remember the dark old days of certification. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would almost be incomprehensible uh, today. And as uh, you know, both the ambassador and Jose Antonio said, you know, the, the clear determination to fight uh, uh, this drug issue has never been more prevalent. And I, my sense is, although I don't have any way of really knowing, that the cooperation at uh, both an operational level and an intelligence uh, sharing level has never, never been higher. But you know, I think there are a couple of issues that, uh, so, so the base, I think the foundations get, get higher. Um, I mean, we still have a couple of problems with the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement that need to be addressed and solved, but, but clearly that has been uh, a, a real foundation to the economic benefit of both countries. It seems to me that the challenge is really two things. One, uh, sort of at the uh, micro level, of, of taking some of these policies that have been initiated and actually getting the bureaucracies to deliver. I talk about the Merida Initiative. Uh, I don't know. I've read so many different uh, numbers of how much money has actually gone into Mexico. Arturo, you can probably shed some light on that. But it's clear that in some of these fundamental issues, our bureaucracies need to be more agile uh, and uh, perhaps more politically pressed. Um, so there's an operational issue of sort of getting things done uh, that need to be done that have already been decided on that can be of benefit to both countries. And then I think on the other side, we need to really look uh, at the big picture. I mean, we're all focused on incremental steps, looking at what's immediately ahead of us, what's doable. But I think that there really are not a lot of people out there looking for really large issues. You touched on one which I think could be tremendous, which is the health issue. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, Bob Pastor is probably one of the few people that has constantly been looking at you know, sort of the North American community. And these things have difficult uh, issues surrounding them, but if you're not talking about them, if you're not looking at them, we don't really have a road map to the future. And uh, so I hope that the new administration, when the uh, uh, both of our administrations are, well, our administration really is fully staffed on uh, Mexico, uh, will do two things. They'll make sure that what we're doing for, the, for today is being done efficiently and effectively, and that they'll start looking at what the long-term goals uh, for our relationship should be. It, let, let, let me yeah, jump in jump on in. this, because I, I'd like to try and tie two themes that have come up here uh, in, in these initial remarks. Uh, the first one is uh, Mexico's response to H1N1, and to Roger's point of how institutional buildup uh, helps uh, at this given moment in time. Um, H1N1, I think, was in many ways a was proof of two things. One, when presidents meet, a lot of the people in this room say, "Well, but you know, beyond the speeches, what gets accomplished?" I think that H1N1 and the collaboration cooperation that was triggered between both governments gave substance to what happened both in January and then in April between both presidents. There was tangible proof that the dialogue that is being kicked off between a new administration and an incumbent Mexican government is starting to prov provide deliverables. The cooperation, the rapid response between both governments to ensure the safety of people on both sides of the border is a tangible product of that initial dialogue. Number two, that what we saw with H1N1 didn't happen overnight. In 2004, Mexico and the United States, within the context of the SPP, the Security and, Partnership, uh, the Security and Prosperity Partnership, agreed and decided that given what had happened with SARS and avian flu, that we could be faced with a challenge of this magnitude in North America, and started preparing for a contingency like this one. And it was precisely the footwork that was done between 2004 and H1N1 that allowed Mexico, Canada, and the United States to quickly, transparently, aggressively put in motion those standard operating procedures that we spent three, four years developing. And this brings me to the second point. This is, again, tangible proof to many of you out there that say, oh, all these meetings and summits, and we never see any tangible proof of how these things affect the well-being of the citizens of North America. This is a very clear example of institutional building, and of how a good constructive dialogue that is being kicked off by President Obama and President Calderon is providing deliverables. 
Jose Antonio, this has been going on also in the, in the business community. It's been going on in civil society. It's been going on. I mean, do you see this changing? I mean, the, the coming together of people on both sides of the border, developing a capacity of Mexican businesses, for example, to work across the border in the U.S. and U.S. businesses also learning how to manage in, in Mexico and beginning to talk about some of these larger issues. I think there there's a lot of um, <clears throat> well, I mean, business community has always been sometimes even blamed on two too much oriented towards the United States. Uh, the, sometimes we, re, we re, receive uh, blames from Europe or some, more, or even Latin America that we should not depend so much on the United States. And maybe it's true in a certain way, for instance, the auto industry, which now is suffering because the American auto, indu American auto industry is suffering and the Mexican auto industry, which we depend a lot from them, is, is also suffering. But uh, that's why I mentioned these other issues like health or energy, where there are a lot of things that we could do together. But uh, what I, I see much more in uh, all the community, not only in business community, but in political community, for instance, is pragmatism. And I think that is a very interesting thing. I was, uh, I was invited to the Obama's dinner, and I had, uh, I, and I had a, a very nice uh, uh, issue that I didn't expect to see which was Senator Navarrete from PRD approaching President Obama and saying, I represent the responsible left and I would like to start a dialogue with you and with your government. And uh, President Obama reacted very positively and said, this dialogue has just started. I never thought of hearing that thing happening. And I, w I felt very good of, my, of this kind of, of, of uh, politicians, you know, from the leftist, very nice guy. Despite that's pragmatism. The fact, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's really pragmatism, what, which is, I think, important for the future, you know? Yeah. Well, Roger, one, you, you threw in some notes of caution that, I mean, there's always sort of this moment of, of coming together at the beginning of administrations, and then, you know, we get a little bit distracted along the way. What are some of the caution signs? How, how do we well, not get over-enthusiastic? I, I sometimes think that our relationship, everybody knows how incredibly important it is, but it's always hostage to sort of unexpected events. So if you could tell me what the future of our foreign policy or the global <laughs> economy is going to be in the next two or three years, I can tell you what the caution signs would be. But, and I, I don't know the answer to it because it really, I, I think you could take you know, a thousand important people in the governments of both sides and they would say, what is the single most important bilateral relationship we have? And virtually all of them would say it's the United States and Mexico for each other because we interact in so many ways. But how to keep that on the front burner, you know, when... Uh, uh, North Korea comes uh, along or uh, you know, problems in the Swat Valley, uh, we seem to be constantly focused on threats far, far away from us. And so I guess the real is issue is that the people who are going to be in the policy decisions need to keep reminding themselves a kind of mantra of we need to continue to, to nurture and, uh, this relationship uh, because it's not traditionally, a, it's not a relationship in conflict, it's never been a sort of military, uh, at least in this century, uh, uh, issue for the United States, but it's critically important. And I think it's going to become more important uh, uh, as uh, the large Mexican-American population in this country uh, grows and matures and, and, and people understand the enormous impact and value they have to our economy and to our society. And it's always harder to, to focus on opportunities than threats sometimes. That's right. It clearly is. Let's take a couple questions actually from the audience. Back to the panelists, and then we'll, we'll move into our second panel once they've had a chance to respond. Does anyone want to throw anything out there? Richard. Richard Downey, right here. And if you could identify, name and organization. Oh, well, Richard. Thank you. Yes, Richard Downey from the Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. Thank you very much for a very engaging uh, opening dialogue. Uh, Ambassador Sarkhan, you opened up uh, talking about the plan against drugs and thugs. And I mean, I think everyone in this room certainly recognizes the courage that President Calderon and the, and the entire administration has had in really engaging uh, frontally, front up this, this whole effort with drugs and thugs. Uh, one of the original plans was that uh, while President Calderon made the decision to use the military to focus on, uh, on organized crime and drugs, that uh, there would be an effort to increase the size of the police. Uh, to, uh, to really take on for the long, range, long term that effort. And it seems that the military's role has been increasing. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how that effort to uh, 
uh, to build the institutions of the police to really be viable in that fight are going. Let me, let's take one more from the audience, and then we'll come back to, to our panelists. Anyone else want to jump in? <coughs> Hi, uh, this is Harry Inman. I'm just a lawyer. But what is, <laughs> <laughs> what is the status in regard to the trucking situation? Uh, the trucks coming from Mexico to the United States, are there negotiations going on now? What is the status of that? Ambassador, do you want to start off on this? Yeah. <laughs> um, Police and trucking. The, as most of you in the room know, that uh, the demonstration program that was put together by the Bush administration um, was defanged by Congress uh, through the omnibus bill that was approved um, early this year. Um, there are, as we understand, efforts uh, being made by this administration to engage with Congress in trying to find a solution. Uh, I have been told the idea would be a long-lasting solution, not another pilot program, to the issue of non U.S. non-compliance of NAFTA on the use of trucks. Um, but I have the impression that uh, they're not quite ready to roll this one out yet. Um, we have stated clearly that uh, for us the issue of uh, U.S. compliance on the issue of trucks is critical. Um, until that compliance is observed, we will maintain uh, the countermeasures that were imposed by Mexico uh, up to $2.9 billion uh, in merchandise. And we will continue to uh, be willing to engage both with the administration and in Congress to ensure that Mexican drivers, safe Mexican trucks and safe Mexican drivers are back on American roads. Um, on the issue of um, civilian capabilities and institutions, it, it, it is an ongoing process, Rich. It's um, obviously uh, every, every time you um, bump into corruption, in, especially in local and state uh, law enforcement institutions, that sets back your ability to continue moving forward. Um, the idea and the end game for the president is that the military presence is a stopgap measure, that for a good reason in this country you have posa comitatus, which prevents the armed forces from being used as a law enforcement tool. I think it doesn't make sense to use the armed forces over a long period of time as a law enforcement tool. It's dangerous. Uh, it doesn't make institutional sense. And uh, the president's endgame is as soon as he can and as quickly as it's feasibly possible and operationally possible to redeploy the armed forces and put in the new vetted units that are being trained uh, in the federal police. So, Antonio, how do you feel about the, the security situation in Mexico? I mean, this is something that, that you certainly live with in Monterey, but also other places that you are in Mexico. Well, do you feel optimistic over time? or Definitely optimistic on, on what is happening, uh, worried, because uh, we have had maybe the last 36 to 40 months very, very difficult. Uh, we started seeing... Uh, this is a problem that comes uh, when uh, uh, some people could say, well, drug dealers are killing themselves, which uh, uh, eventually w w we saw a lot of those things first. But the problem is that uh, we started seeing stored uh, uh, assaults and, and kidnapping from other people that uh, using the distraction of uh, all the police people with this kind of drug problems started to commit other kind of uh, illicit, small ones if you want, but uh, we have been seen escalating the number of assaults to our convenience stores uh, multiplied by three or, or four in certain states, casually the same states or same cities where there is a big uh, uh, problem with uh, drugs like uh, Ciudad Juarez or Tijuana. But the minute you start proving that you can, you're, go, you're going to fight back and, and start getting some of, of those bands uh, to jail, the, the, the problem goes down very fast. You remember that uh, all the, the tricks that were used in New York to clean New York some years ago, uh, no broken windows, and remember all that zero tolerance issues. The same things are very useful in Mexico. You start fighting back, putting to jail some of the people, promoting the, the, how do you call the denouncing, the people calling and saying, hey, I know where these guys are doing something wrong. And uh, the society has to act a lot more. 
Um, I'm sure that uh, they are starting to be convinced that uh, if, if without the help of society, government, with army, without army, with police, with whatever, we are not going to be fighting back unless everybody gets involved and, say, uh, and denounces and helps on this issue. And Roger, how do we get back to talking about economic issues again in the relationship? I mean, security has clearly been the issue that's been front and center, but we've talked a little bit about health care, we've talked about education, we've talked about a series of things that could be on the agenda. Is there a way we can get back to talking about those issues? And should we also be thinking in terms of North America, in terms of broader cooperation on competitiveness issues in, in North America? Well, most of my Mexican friends say the most important thing we can do is to get our own house in order because until the United States' economic situation is back up and functioning, uh, it's going to be very difficult uh, for us to, to move beyond, beyond that. So I, I'm happy that our president and the economic team are, are really focusing on the domestic economy in the United States. I think that's probably the best thing we can do uh, for Mexico's economy at this point. I'm not sure if you agree. Yes. Um, but again, this sort of longer-term vision um, of, of how uh, the United States, Mexico, and Canada could interact in a way that made all three of our countries uh, more competitive and an increasingly competitive world is, a, is, again, something that people have been talking about for 20 years. And, uh, and we make incremental changes. Uh, we make incremental improvements. Um, but I think that you touched on the energy issue. Uh, uh, you know, full disclosure, I work for an oil company. Um, but uh, I think it's amazing in a way that we don't have uh, uh, the technology and financial clout of you know, oil companies all over the world helping Mexico uh, uh, replace you know, what appears to be uh, you know, uh, the, a significantly diminishing resource in Contrell. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, you know, there are, there are sometimes non, um, well, I, would say I was going to say irrational, that's not the right way, but there are historical reasons for uh, countries to be more cautious in opening up than others. And so we clearly know, as I see Lazaro in the audience, that uh, uh, there are a lot, a lot of historical issues that need to be resolved. But, yes. but that's a perfect issue. I mean, we, the United States, Canada, and Mexico has enormous energy reserves, uh, both uh, traditional and non-traditional. And to be able to limit the amount of money that our industries have to pay for electricity power uh, is yes. a huge advantage uh, to uh, uh, North American corporations uh, competing abroad. Can I add a little uh, final word? Something you know, in relative terms that I didn't mention about security. Uh, Mexico, if you average the problem of security that, that is uh, separated from the drug uh, problem, it's in a much better position than some other countries in Latin America, to be honest. The thing is that we come from almost zero problems to, to now big problems, and we are very worried about it. But uh, I can tell you, we, we bottle Coca-Cola in nine countries in Latin America, and I have some countries, I know that we have to to send a, an armed policeman in every truck of Coca-Cola in certain countries of, Latin, of Central America, for instance, that we have uh, big problems in, in Brazil, in certain places of Brazil, not, not all the country, but in certain places in Brazil. I can guarantee you, in Venezuela, you, there, is, there is no rule of law at all in certain things about, uh, and kidnapping is, is the name of the game. So. If you compare that with Mexico, Mexico is, is below the average of the, of the problems. Colombia is be, of, above the average, honestly. Certain parts of Mexico are above the average, but certain others are in real problems. Which is a good, um, as we close here, I think that that's, points to the fact that we need to expand some of the conversations that have gone on between the United States and Mexico on security issues beyond these two countries and think a little bit more region-wide yes. in terms of some of these issues. And, and clearly, we're talking about organized crime tied to drug trafficking. We're not going to be able to make any headway if we're not dealing with the U.S. side of the equation, with the consumption side, with the arms, and with the, the financial flows that are going back to Latin America. But this is a place where perhaps U.S.-Mexico collaboration can be expanded beyond and become a demonstration for Yes. other sorts of efforts that, that go beyond those two countries. I want to thank our panel for being up here. Um, this is a good opening. It's a very quick panel to open up ideas. We're going to get into some of these issues in more depth. Please don't leave us. Um, a round of applause and, and invite our next panel to come up here.
know. He's a, he's a very nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he, he should learn there English, though. <laughs> hey, Maria. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Jim Colby, how are you? Good to see you. How are you? Good to see you. Yes, pleasure. How are you? How are you? So, it's everybody's... We're all live uh, here. Wired up, or almost wired up. We'll, we'll dive in. I think that, as Andrew said, was a... A very good introduction to some of the general yeah. outlines of the discussion today. I think what we'll try to do uh, in this uh, panel is to try to drill down uh, on some of the individual issues while keeping in mind what Roger Wall said about the big picture. And I, th I think that it's important and would encourage uh, all of our panelists to sort of think about if we're talking about redefinitions here, uh, to, uh, to walk out on the plank a little bit and, uh, and tell us what you're your vision is. I guess my uh, sense after listening to uh, the opening is to the question, uh, is there a qualitative change in U.S.-Mexican relations? The answer was sort of, eh, maybe, uh, or maybe a little. And I think um, uh, that will be something that we'll try to, I think, try to find the measure of during this conversation. Um, I thought just to start, I would ask uh, Ambassadors Jones and, and Rosenthal to, to reflect a little bit on sort of where we are today. I think um, it would be good to try to, to mark a place in time, because as the previous panel said, some of these things are cyclical, some of them feel new, and as we try to measure uh, the distance or proximity of the rhetoric to reality on some of these issues, some sense of historical perspective, I think, would be useful. And before I get to them, I would uh, reiterate Andrew's um, not only encouragement, but requirement uh, that uh, you formulate your own questions and throw them at this panel. And you don't have to be on the board of the Mexican, Mexico <laughs> Institute to be called on. And uh, I think as soon as we get through an initial round here, uh, we'll look for questions uh, from the audience. So Ambassador Jones, would you like to start by just giving us some of your reflections on the general question of qualitative change? Well, I think as somebody said, I think Roger said, it's been a progressive movement forward, but I think qualitatively our relationship is better than I've seen in my lifetime. And part of that, it all starts at the top. Uh, my sense was that President Calderon had a sort of typical uh, view of American uh, government officials and was not very trustworthy, uh, very wary of mm -hmm. them. Uh, after he and President Obama met, I sensed a basically a 180 degree turn in his attitude toward uh, United States and vice versa. The, the, so I think at the top it started out very, very well and I think will continue very well. What is different, I think, uh, because President Clinton had a very good relationship with President Zedillo when I was ambassador, but as you went down through the government, the understanding of Mexico and the relationships as you went through the bureaucracy was not as good as I see it today. Uh, last week we started, uh, I was appointed to a, a task force on, uh, on southwest border security. And uh, one of the things that was so evident, Janet Napolitano, Eric Holder, uh, and the drug czar were there among several assistant secretaries. And what was different now was a much better understanding of Mexico. Uh, not, uh, not, um, uh, 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 a good understanding that didn't exist through the government when I was ambassador. And I think that's a big, big difference today. So going forward, I think that um, even if there are some, some big events that we're not anticipating now, I think we'll continue to build on the quality of the relationship that has started out. And uh, my personal view, you say, where, where are we going? I still believe, probably not by law or treaty, but that we will be a borderless uh, economy in the next 20 years, mm -hmm. just de facto. Okay. <laughs> you, you, asked us, you asked us to walk the plank. I'm going to walk it and I'm going to jump off of Good it. For you. Good for you. And I'm going to say that um, from the historical perspective, which comes sometime between ages 60 and 65, I won't say exactly which age, um, the relationship is, is as, as Ambassador Jones has described it, I think it's probably in reality and in the day-to-day -day <coughs> operation of the relationship as good as it's ever been. Um, but I also think that the euphoria of a new relationship, a new era, a new beginning that we tend to put on the table every time a new administration comes into office 
uh, requires uh, some requires to be tempered by some reality. Uh, first of all, not only because the U.S. administration, the Obama administration, has its hands full with an enormous number of issues elsewhere in the world, uh, mainly outside of Latin America, but to some extent also in Latin America, but also because the Calderon administration has its own agenda mm -hmm. uh, of uh, domestic issues, all of which are taking up an enormous amount of time and discussion uh, within, within the country. Uh, this is, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting dichotomy because this is the first time that I can remember in which a willing U.S. administration, willing in the sense of looking at ways to improve the relationship and to move forward on some of the issues that have been on the agenda for a long time. Obviously, the, 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 the immigration issue, also partly the, the, the fight against drug trafficking and so on, is not being met by a corresponding willingness on the Mexican side with the Mexican administration. This, this, uh, the, the Mexican administration we have today is an administration that really does not look outward, outside of Mexico as much as if you were to compare it with the Salinas administration or the Cedillo administration or the Fox administration. Uh, this is an administration that is very much concentrated on solving domestic problems. Uh, it has an election coming up in three weeks. Uh, it has uh, a series of challenges to its authority, both politically, socially, and economically. A president who has promised uh, to be an administration of employment, mm -hmm. of economic growth, and of security, uh, in effect has very little to show in three years for, for any of those uh, topics. So there is this uh, imbalance, if you like, uh, I have no doubt that the Obama administration means well. I think that there are lots of things it would like to do. Um, but we'll have to see whether all of these issues can, in effect, be translated into uh, real policy. Uh, the one issue on which I think we can already see progress, and that is the Mexican uh, demand that the U.S. do more to interdict uh, arms traffic between the U.S. and Mexico has now led to a concerted effort at the border to inspect uh, vehicles and traffic between the U.S. and Mexico going from north to south, which has also led to an enormous hue and cry because all of a sudden it takes an hour or two to cross from the U.S. to Mexico when it only used to take uh, half a minute to go through the, the Mexican customs. Uh, so, so we'll have to see. I, 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 I am somewhat cautious, and I, I think that, you know, uh, euphoria is wonderful, and rhetoric is great, and speeches are wonderful, and visits are wonderful, and I'm very happy that all these people went to Mexico, some of them for the first time. But, uh, you know, the realities of the relationship always come up. They always tend to bubble up very quickly, and uh, we'll have to see what happens. So rhetoric and, and realities, yeah, Jim Colby, you've been watching this relationship and participating in it for a long time from a border state. Where, how important is the rhetoric to begin with? So, so creating a new language and a new tone, uh, is it just sort of the overture to a deeper relationship or does it have more substantial meaning? And where do you see the distance between that rhetoric and the policy? Well, I didn't think Anders jumped into too deep water there. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it was pretty shallow <laughs> pond that you got into, but that's all right. Uh, I think it is important. I think the rhetoric is important uh, it, because it kind of sets a tone. And, and if, what I have seen over my time, 22 years that I s served in Congress, all but two of them on the U.S.-Mexico legislative parliamentary exchange, uh, is they, a, a, what I would call a growing maturity mm -hmm. in the relationship. The way in which uh, both sides address the issues, the way in which it's addressed in the media, the way in which public officials, the way in which members of Congress address it, has shown a much greater balance and maturity. That's not to say that couldn't change back again in, in the future. But I think even when it gets to some of the really hot button issues in, in both countries like immigration, I think that there has been a greater sense of, of looking at this with maturity and with balance. So I think those, the, the rhetoric uh, is an important factor <laughs> uh, in, in the kind, the quality 
of the relationship that we have. But ultimately, it is, of course, how we deal with these issues and how the two countries uh, interact with each other on them. And I think overall, it's been a positive. Uh, we are seeing positive trends that are happening there. But as Andres says, uh, the rhetoric is one thing, the action is another thing. Uh, and these, these issues have a way of coming and going. They, they come one day and a different one appears uh, the next day. And we've seen how uh, immigration, for example, is the great hot button in this country a couple of years ago, has now faded a bit because the, we're not seeing the illegal immigration coming in thanks or on thanks to the economy, uh, the weakened economy here in the United States. Uh, and, and so it's a, it, it, it takes the pressure off of, of that issue. That's not to say that couldn't come back or there won't be some other kind of issue that, that we see. But clearly, what I think that both in the sense of the way Congress deals with it, the media deals with it, public officials uh, deal with it, and I think the quality of the cooperation we're seeing on the law enforcement side uh, is, is markedly different than when I first uh, went to Congress. Mm -hmm. um, Javier, um, e even though I, I, I spent my life in newspapers, I do occasionally read blogs. Uh, I do occasionally read your blog. <laughs> and you wrote a blog post last week uh, that was called Sin Ambición, uh, that basically said, I don't, uh, I don't see any uh, dig, uh, deep digging here. Um, could you take us into uh, a specific issue now where you see, you, you believe that no new thinking or new ideas are being applied and perhaps we're not, we're, we're, we're seeing light where there's really just uh, smoke? Yeah. Well, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I think that we cannot say, at least not yet, uh, that the U.S.-Mexico relationship has changed qualitatively. And um, so the start of the new chapter of the relationship was good. Yeah, it was a lot of expectation. And, uh, but overall, the, the relationship is still uh, drifting downstream and mainly following the current set by, set, uh, set by the previous administration and not going upstream against the current as we expected to have something, a uh, big idea in terms of how to bring the relationship, Mexico, U.S. relations to a different uh, level. So no, no improvement in a significant way. So instead of taking advantage of the crisis that uh, the different crises that we are facing uh, to the two countries, which are impacting both, so the Obama and the Calderon administration seem to have opted for pragmatic, low cost, and and business as usual approach uh, for the uh, U.S.-Mexico relationship. So in paraphrasing, I read uh, an article by by Richard Haas the other day, published in the Washington Post, mm -hmm. the President of the Council on Foreign Relations, that should apply to the Mexico-U.S. Uh, relation case, which is uh, they are defining success down. And as it is happening with the case of uh, other countries in Central Asia. And it seems to me that there are three um, statu quo drivers for the relationship now. One is uh, that Mexico still has, a, I would say, a low-high priority. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the overall picture of the U.S., uh, government agenda. And it is a low high, which is, is the structural low priority of Mexico, which is at the higher end because of the wrong reasons. has to do with some of the problems with the drug trafficking and, uh, and, and the all-out war that we're facing uh, in Mexico against criminal organizations. And, and also because uh, some kind of the violence could really threat, uh, threaten the, 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 the common border. Uh, the second element of, of this uh, status quo, uh, or the, the driver the, for this status quo, is is that the U.S. approach, U.S. approach to the bilateral agenda, is basically based <clears throat> on the domestic agenda of the U.S. Uh, and that has to do with issues regarding drugs and also immigration and trade, and and we can discuss more more in detail uh, in in the following minutes. And the third driver, I would say, is that perhaps this sounds not politically correct here, but I would say that, that uh, the former administration did a good work in terms of uh, driving some important issues like the Merida Initiative, so some issues regarding immigration, and, and that the administration of Presid President Obama is following what happened, I mean, what started in the last administration. So we, say, we see kind of a continuity, which is uh, comfortable for the two administrations, but it is not getting us to an important level. Uh -huh. uh, Maria Chavista, do you see continuity here? Or do you see a, a change? Um, I do see some continuity. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, 
always have to acknowledge that uh, President Bush did attempt to take on the issue of immigration reform, uh, perhaps at a moment with very little political capital, but nonetheless, um, he did try. I actually um, think that uh, when we're talking about the relationship between both countries, we should be mindful that those, the relationship among and between elected leadership and the elite, if you will, and then there's the relationship between the peoples of both countries. And, and I don't want to lose sight of that because in some ways um, it uh, is both uh, closer relationship in a very you know, profound ways in which families are connected and relationships are deep, but it's also problematic uh, in ways of the fear that so many um, U.S. born uh, Americans have of, um, of newcomers, of immigrants, and I simply have to uh, make mention of uh, the recent uh, hate crime in Pennsylvania, a person mm -hmm. from Mexico brutally killed. And, um, not something we acknowledge, but it is representative of a certain fear that's going on and uh, that makes the relationship difficult. So um, I think that there is um, not yet a qualitative difference, uh, either at the elite or at, if you will, at the people to people, but there are great expectations and, uh, and it's going to require uh, leadership at all of those levels, I think. So, um, I, I, somebody out there, I hope, is keeping score how many for, how many against, uh, <laughs> qualitative change, some in the middle. Um, Carlos, what, uh, so Arturo Saracan uh, talked a little bit about a, a more holistic approach, and, and that's really also it, it encompasses uh, cultural changes, cultural coming together, uh, <coughs> and, and also raises the question about whether or not the relationship is still driven principally by big ticket issues and that the, the list of issues like energy reform, healthcare, education always stay at a sort of low level that don't bubble up. Where do you see uh, the relationship in those terms now? Is it still being driven uh, principally by the, by the big issues that also have big domestic constituencies in each country? Yes, the answer is yes, Phil. I, I think that um what, uh, what Roger said about if we ask people what is the single most important bilateral relationship that each country has, uh, you assumed that uh, many, many people or the wide majority of people would say in the United States it's Mexico, in Mexico it's the United States. I'm not so sure about that here, but uh, in Mexico it's, it's a fact of life. Um, but I have another question which is what is the single most important issue in that bilateral relationship, which mm -hmm. is, addresses your question. My answer is the single most important issue in the bilateral relationship is closing the development gap between Mexico and the United States. Mm -hmm. But we're not, we're not addressing that issue. We're addressing the uh, flavor of the day. We're addressing security and drugs because they have become crisis and, and our crisis is overflowing uh, across the border. Uh, but we have lost sight of the long-range long, long range issue. And Jim, did I hear you well that in 20 years' time we're going to have a de facto, borderless, de facto <laughs> <laughs> borderless economy. economy? Because uh, I think that our, our challenge now is precisely to move from shared responsibility to shared strategies, which is the title of this panel. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton became, you know, we liked her before she went to Mexico, but we loved her when she said it's a shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. But how do we move from shared responsibility to shared strategy? And that's, that's the challenge that we all face. I'd love to just throw that question out to the panel. Anybody want to take that? How do you engineer a shift from shared responsibility to shared strategy? And what, does the, what are the outlines of that strategy feel like? Or what would they feel like? I think, uh, number one, I think Carlos is right. We have, to, we have to close the gap between the United States and Mexico. We have to close the gap within Mexico between the rich exactly. and the poor. Yeah. And I think there's only uh, three ways to do that, health, education, and infrastructure. And I think the United States can play a very big role in all three of those to help close that gap. It's in our best interest. 
because as we close the gap, we increase the markets for the U.S. goods and services. It's in Mexico's interest because if you get bring 40 percent of the people into the system, have something worth defending, you're going to defend democracy and all those other things. So I think that is, to me, the key question in our future relationship. But I would, I would argue with Javier uh, that I'm not sure what you think is the, where we ought to be at this stage in our relationship. But I see this very much, our relationship, very much like the civil rights progress in the United States. When I was in the White House and President Johnson had us passing civil rights and, and voting rights legislation, it has taken a long time to have a better understanding of particularly African Americans and, and, and others in this country <coughs> and minorities in the majority of this country. But now we're somewhat taking it for granted. We've made huge progress. Are we where we ought to be? No. But considering the last four decades, we are way ahead of where we are. I see the same thing in Mexico and the United States. I see, as I said from last week's meeting and other, uh, other meetings, in, that the U.S. government understands more about Mexico today than they did when I was there as ambassador. I was educating U.S. government, Congress, as well as, as our own government uh, below President Clinton as much as I was about Mexico, as much as I was trying to educate Mexico about the United States. And that has changed dramatically. And the understanding of, of American people has changed dramatically because of the Calderon government's uh, uh, attack on the organized crime uh, efforts in uh, in Mexico. But I see our agenda is much broader than just uh, mm -hmm. uh, crime, drugs, et cetera, immigration. Yep. And I see we have really set the stage to, and I, this is where I quarrel with Javier, I don't think there's anything wrong with pragmatic uh, mm -hmm. approaches to problems. And, uh, and so I think that we have set the stage to solve problems as they come up by this new understanding of each other and, and a pragmatic approach. Please. On the question of a strategy or moving from, you know, recognizing shared responsibility to actually sitting down and drafting a blueprint for where we want to go, I think both countries uh, are missing a, a clear objective of what they want in their bilateral relationship. Uh, I think on, on the part of both, of both governments, and, and this is not just governments, it also probably extends to, to various parts of, of our two societies. We really have, we, 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 we're of mixed feelings about what we want. Uh, in the U.S., uh, in, in Mexico, starting with Mexico, we, we're all, we, we've always been ambivalent about being too close to the United States, about somehow uh, threatening our independence, our sovereignty, uh, and, and therefore we have been reluctant to move boldly forward, except during the Salinas administration when NAFTA was negotiated. That was about the only time that there has been a real decision towards a clear objective. You may agree with it or not agree with it, but it was a clear objective. Um, on the U.S. side, I think there isn't either, either a clear objective as to what you want with Mexico. Uh, if you wanted Mexico to be uh, to reduce the, the income disparities, if you want Mexico to become a more educated, a healthier, a more prosperous society, then there are a series of things that uh, the U.S. and others, by the way, not just the U.S., I, I include Canada, could do to, to push Mexico and to bring it up to certain levels the way the Europeans did with their uh, poorer, uh, newer entrance into the European community and then the European Union. Uh, part of it may be financial resources, but a lot of it has to do with investment, with uh, investment in infrastructure, not as a giveaway, but as a business, as, as a profit, with a profit motive. Uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, changing the, the, the whole mindset about immigration, uh, the way the Europeans have. Uh, they've been criticized for it in some ways, things have changed in other ways. But they did take a decision that they were going to use the comparative advantage of labor mobility as part of their overall competitive advantage, and, and it has worked probably overall in Europe to their benefit. 
Um, those are strategic issues and, and, and things which the United States could decide to do. I don't think they, they have. I don't think that you have. Uh, I think there are still various discussions going on about this. Um, I hope that uh, Jim's right <clears throat> about the 20-year time frame. I would have put it a little bit further. But what I do know is that we are in a process of integration, and that process is ongoing. And the big decision that both governments face, and I would add Canada for that matter, is, is that process going to be guided or is it going to be haphazard? Is it just going to happen on the basis of inertia or is it going to be taken in a direction by our private sectors, our governments and our societies? And that, I think, is still the big dilemma that uh, surrounds the North American concept, NAFTA, NAFTA Plus, and all the other discussions about our trilateral and, and our bilateral relationship. So I, I, I'll come right, right back to you. I just want to throw out a question, and you can address it now, or we can circle around. So what I'm hearing is uh, that there's shared, a sense of shared responsibility for strategies that are as yet unformed and uh, as yeah. yet agreed upon. So I do think it'd be useful at some point in this discussion to, for somebody to bring us uh, deeper into an individual issue. So. Uh, uh, what, how would we measure and test this shared responsibility? What would be the milestones for saying on security or on immigration uh, or on dealing with uh, shared and new, maybe the surprises uh, that uh, Roger Wallace was describing come still, they're still embedded in the economic and financial crisis that we haven't seen play out entirely and their, their, their shared um, challenges there. But I, I do want to keep that question in front of us and, 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 um, and ask, uh, ask you to think about bringing us into an individual issue and showing us what you would say would be the individual or, or the specific milestones towards seeing a change. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria, why don't you go ahead? Uh, I would just, uh, in two areas, I think what Andres said about whether we're going to do this in a haphazard way or with intentionality is really the crux of it. And that happens over and over on, on public policy issues. And I think we're on, on the issue of development of human capital, labor mobility. You have a situation in which Mexico's high school graduation rate is uh, just under 50% of its adult population. Mm. All right? It has an impact in migration in this country given who's coming and the low levels of education. And yet we have uh, an aging population with enormous health care needs in which a young population with proper training could both provide the care for an elderly population, have good middle class jobs that would benefit both countries. It requires some coordination on our side in terms of what we're investing in, in our community colleges, in, the communi in, in our side. But on the other side as well, if there was an intentionality, if we could actually be, yes, you're picking winners and losers sometimes, but, but Otherwise, we're going to be left with a situation in which we will have to import nurses from the Philippines, no problem, except that we have people who need jobs just south of the border. So there's, there's a way if we were really thinking about uh, development of human capital in ways that are beneficial to both sides, that requires to look at labor conditions and working conditions and not simply uh, our historical uh, preference for cheap labor. Carlos? I would I, go ahead. <laughs> I think to, to, um, to follow up on what Maria just said, I, I, I think we have to, uh, I mean the United States and Mexico, uh, have to take a joint look at the um, current uh, situation and the future trends in demographics economic integration and education of the labor force, which are the issues she mentioned. Uh, if only because we have such a de facto integration in so many areas of the economy uh, that that's only going to grow over time. Of course, some people will say, uh, well, let it be. Don't codify it because you will ruin it even more. Uh, but other people, and I am among the latter, will say we need to. We need to, um, to take this joint look at the future. The Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States has said that between 2010 and 2030, 100% of the growth 
accruing to the labor force of the United States will come from immigration. So um, what do we do about that? And just a footnote on, on, on um, uh, closing the development gap. Um, in Mexico, we have to be prepared uh, to specify and determine what our bargaining chips are in this whole debate, because we are used to telling the U.S., you got to admit more of our people into your labor force, but we are not prepared to say what we're doing inside Mexico to bridge the development gap between the north and the south and between the uh, area, areas of the economy that are plugged into the glo global economy and, and those that are not. So we got an enormous work to do inside Mexico to even ad begin to address these issues. Mm -hmm. Congressman. I would just note that the, the struggle of how we move from shared responsibilities to shared strategies uh, that we have with Mexico and the United States is not different, not much different than the same kind of problem that the United States would share with other countries that are uh, in the same category of being a developing country, whether we're talking about China or, or India or uh, perhaps even, even Brazil. You know, you ex exclude Canada and Western Europe where there's much more of a cultural uh, and, and you know, shared, shared culture, shared background in, in institutions. But you get to other countries, I think this kind of struggle uh, it, it goes on. So I don't think it's that much different except, of course, for the proximity of Mexico and the fact that it is such a big trading partner and the fact that it is such a good big supplier of labor to, uh, to this country and the fact that we are such, so heavily invested uh, in Mexico. The proximity makes it all the more intense, but I don't think the fact that you have this struggle is that, uh, that different. And I would just say in, in answer to your question, how would we measure, take one of those issues and how would we measure whether what our success is would be. Well, I thought about that with regard to immigration, and I guess the ultimate success would be when Mexico's a visa-free country, wouldn't it? But that may be a little while away. And, and think of how that issue is tied, of course, back to the economic issues. Hmm. Um, Chris, I, I would say, say, I'm sorry, Javier, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I would say, I mean, just uh, going back to your specific question in terms of just looking at some issues, I would say, why don't you, I mean, take a look at what happens with security and with immigration. Um, yeah, it is good to have shared responsibilities and shared strategies, if possible, but we don't have a shared vision uh, as well for, for coping with those issues. Uh, for instance, while the Mexican government, President Calderon administration, mm -hmm. is fighting our life in, in terms of this all-out war on drugs, we still have the Merida Initiative in risk in the U.S. Congress and in terms of the funding of the initiative and, and the sharing of intelligence and the equipment and all that, and, and, and even further, uh, you had just on May 14, uh, the same day that, that I was quoting the, the Richard Haas article in the Washington Post, well, in the Wall Street Journal, the drug czar, Mr. Curly Kosky, he declared the end of the war on drugs. And, I mean, and, and, and that was uh, something, I mean, very dramatic. I mean, sending the wrong signal to those in Mexico who are really fighting uh, a real war and we are losing lives. So this is not a shared vision. Going to migration, yeah, it is important to, 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 to see that... Uh, uh, yeah, um, that our future goes together in terms of labor mobility and all that. But at the same time, if you look at the papers in the last weeks, the Homeland Security Department was releasing some information about one $6.7 billion invested or, being in, or, or are going, is going to be invested that, that huge amount to continue with the virtual fence mm -hmm. along the Mexico youth border in comparison to the $1.4 billion for the Merit Initiative. So $6.7, $1.4 billion. Uh, makes, makes a difference. But not only that, I mean, all the development of new techniques to stop migrants, like something very weird, like called the squid, mm -hmm. which is something like a James Bond, James Bond uh, I mean, movie, that, that they're going to have some, some kind of vehicles with tentacles just to get them in the, the vehicles from, from, the, from the migrants. Or, or the other thing, which is inhumane, which is the wasps. Uh, so the Homeland Security Department and Agriculture Department are developing a kind of wasp, which is going to be released in the Laredo, Texas, and Laredo, Mexico border, with this wasp, this insect, is designed to kill the Carrizo uh, grass, which is, uh, I mean, growing there. And so they say there is not going to attack humans. So wasps are not going to attack humans. I mean, come on, it's, it's, it's something uh, very different. So they, they and, and then the other point about prisoners in the U.S., 
uh, that they're going to check uh, the, the, the immigration status of all prisoners in the, in the different prisons of the U.S. just to repatriate uh, some of them, which is going to increase tenfold the amount of prisoners going back to the countries of origin. So things are continuing the same. So there is no, no dramatic change. And so there is a window of opportunity this summer. We're going to have the summit of North America. President Obama, Prime Minister Harper, President Calderon are going to meet, hopefully, in Mexico. Uh, and uh, and the, is there a big idea of where we want to go? What is the idea of North America? How we want to integrate this region for the future and for our children? <coughs> Um, I'll take a couple. Did you have you wanted to make a quick comment? Well, I just I, you you challenged us to come up with something. Specific. You've been making a list there. I've been right, seeing I have that. A list, so, yeah, I have a list. I have a list. Um, very specific. I mean, let's start with drugs. The one thing that specifically could be done on this issue is for a very serious and credible <coughs> demand reduction policy, which doesn't exist yet. Now, demand reduction can be either through discrimination among drugs or education of people, but the, the true issue of the demand in this country, which fuels most of the violence that's going on in Mexico, has not yet been addressed by this administration, nor has it been addressed by U.S. society. Investment in infrastructure. I, I mentioned the fact that investment in infrastructure is good business. Now, Mexico came out with a big infrastructure, national infrastructure development plan with a great deal of projects which, as used terminology, could be shovel-ready, but there's no money because there no, there's no credit. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that the governments could do, both governments, is use their abilities to guarantee the financing of some of these infrastructure projects on both sides of the border, at the border itself and in Mexico. Uh, the Buy America Act. This is an issue which affects Mexico and Canada in that federal government procurement is exempt in the case of NAFTA countries from the Buy America provisions, but state and municipal procurement isn't because the states and the municipalities are not parties to NAFTA and they consider that they can do whatever they want. This is another issue on which the U.S. government and the Mexican government and the Canadian government could get together to say North America is a special case we are going to apply, we're going to waive the Buy America thing and give the opportunity for Mexicans and Canadians to participate in the economic stimulus packages that are being, that are being uh, applied in the United States. On immigration, I think it's a very simple issue. Hold Mexico to its commitment on shared responsibility by giving the possibility of visas to Mexicans to come and work in the United States when and if their labor is demanded. Mm -hmm. If their labor is demanded, have them be able to go to a U.S. consulate and within 48 hours of proving that their labor is demanded, get a visa and not have to wait 17 years or 20 years. And then at the same time, hold Mexico to its commitment that if there are ways of going to the United States to work legally, then the Mexican government should do its part to ensure that the maximum number of people go in an orderly and legal fashion. And finally, the issue of health care. This is one issue which has been unexplored, but it's very important. It is three to five times more expensive to give primary health care in the United States than it is to give it in Mexico. Why not begin to look at the three issues that are still pending? One is the Social Security Totalization Agreement that has never been ratified by the U.S. Congress, was signed by the two governments, but it languishes in some limbo. And the second is to allow Medicare to pay for primary health care in Mexico mm -hmm. so that people can go and take advantage of Mexican health care, uh, new investment in hospitals at the border, or close to the border, and be able to uh, pay for it with Medicare. If you take five of these five things and you put 10% of each of them into practice, you will have made a substantial difference in the bilateral relationship. I, I would agree with all of those points that Andres made, and also that this uh, North American summit coming up in August mm -hmm. is a place to start that. Mm -hmm. I do know the I don't know about the Mexicans. Ironically, I do know the Canadians are seeking out some big ideas to but, present there. 
I, I believe and I hope that the U.S. government is, and I hope the Mexican mm -hmm. uh, government will. I would add one thing to the list that could be taken up at the, uh, at the summit, and that is to make North America's economy more efficient by combining or rationalizing, harmonizing different regulations, different paperwork to get goods moved from Canada to the U.S. to Mexico and vice versa. It makes us terribly inefficient. This is not something that necessarily has to go through Congress, and that is something that they could specifically uh, com uh, call for at this North American summit. All the things that are on Andres's list are I totally agree with. We cannot expect this North American summit to do it all at the at first blush. They're all running for <coughs> office anyway. They're political animals and they can't do, all, do it all at once. But I do think that that list would be the start. I think the Canadians are, are so into it because they don't want those wasps to That's be right. sent yeah. exactly. <laughs> to the, up to the northern so, border. You want a, just a little disagreement here? Yeah. Okay. I would disagree with them on the, on the Buy America uh, provision. We're already in violation of our uh, WTO uh, requirements and to compound that by now saying we're going to give a special exemption for North America just worsens the situation. The Commerce Department, the government should require, the financial government should require for all the stimulus money, it's federal money, that uh, any contracts that are written have to be, uh, uh, have to be open to anybody that, that bids on them. And I don't think we should try and give a special exemption for North America. Okay, well, I'd like to ask you to hold your thoughts and, and, and invite questions here. We've, we've touched on a lot of issues. We have a lot of questions. Why don't we just start in the back uh, with you back there. No. No, but I can start with Yes, I'm Jose Diaz with Reform and Newspaper from Mexico. And I want to get your opinion on something that Ambassador Sarukan stated in the previous panel. Uh, we're approaching President Calderon's uh, midterm, uh, and I, I am a bit doubtful of whether the whether during his term uh, the army, the armed forces in general, will go back to the barracks. What is your opinion about this? You think that it is possible that within his term, the you know the army and the the marina will be out of public security role? Anybody want to pick that up? I, I would just add to that is, is that an important question for the relationship, too? Does, does the United States have an interest in seeing not the armies run? Mm, that's not, not, not at this time. It could develop into one. But I think our Mexican friends should answer whether they're going back to the barracks or not. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to ask Rod Camp. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, Calderon has been very specific in saying that they will be out of their barracks that is on the streets as long as he is president. He has not said that they will go back to the barracks within his administration. Uh, and of course the question is how long is it going to take for Mexico to create a civilian national police force that can do what police forces need to yeah. do. Right. The army is obviously not the answer. The army is not trained for policing. The army is not like, doesn't like to do these things. People are getting killed um, uh, with great frequency. There is a great deal of uh, exposure by, uh, uh, of military officers to corruption uh, if they are involved in this fight. And uh, the thing is really how long is it going to take to create a national police force? The fact is that this is a, an objective that the Fox administration started with and it's now been eight years and we still haven't gotten to first base. Right. There is no national police force under construction and therefore it's difficult to think that there's going to be an ability to replace the military with something civilian. And I would just say that I, I don't think we have the luxury of sort of waiting for Mexico to figure that out for this, not that we can tell them what to do, but rather that this problem will come back to haunt us because I think history shows all the, the, the sort of more guns, the more police, the more military presence in a society, it's likely to lead to results that will lead to more uh, instability, which we will then uh, have some more migration, et cetera, et cetera. I just, I think we need to be engaged on these issues, although, as Andres says, it doesn't look very hopeful, but, um, but we can't abandon hope. 
Francis, you have a, you have a <laughs> quick comment on this? No, I, I, I was just going to mention that in other episodes of Mexican history, uh, I've heard the military say, uh, do not call the military to solve problems that civilians cannot deal with. Mm -hmm. It is civilians who have to deal with those issues. Yeah. Next question. Uh, oh. Let's <laughs> go here to this young lady right there. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for coming out. Um, this question is for the entire panel. Um, we began this, this panel with a borderless economy. Um, and now I hear <laughs> share <laughs> strategies and Medicare and stimulus fund in New Mexico. Um, is this a borderless economy that is an expansion of NAFTA? Or is this the foundation of a North American Union, something akin to the EU? Mm. No. <laughs> we got a no. We got a no. It's not a. It's not a. It's not, not a. It's not, it's not, not a, a, your, your union. Not a North American yes. Union, similar to the European <laughs> Union. Uh, my feeling is, as you've heard here, some things are happening naturally. One, our demographics are changing. Mexico's is changing. Um, right now, we have a little over a million Americans living in in. Uh, Mexico drawing Social Security checks. I think that's going to continue to increase as our population ages. We're going to have to, we're going to need more and more younger people to keep our economy going. They're mostly going to come from Mexico. So I think just by the, the natural changes demographically and otherwise, we're going to see that we are mutually reliant on each other. And that's what I'm talking about. And, and the more uh, we are reliant on each other, the more I think we're going to demand on both sides that the obstacles to living in either country be removed, such as the uh, changes in the Medicare system so that you can have primary medical care in Mexico and get reimbursed for it, uh, such as trying to make our economies more efficient by moving parts of parts across our borders efficiently. So that's what I'm talking about. And I think eventually the, the Official acts will catch up with the actual acts. Yes, please. Susan Manishkin, I want to move back to the question of the Mexican military going back to the barracks. And that was passed off as that's a question for the Mexicans. But I was wondering <clears throat> to what extent is it actually of very great concern to the United States? We we know well the risks of the Mexican military becoming involved in the drug fight. It's, it's known as an honest institution, but once uh, militaries get involved in those kinds of activities, the temptation for corruption and, and deprofessionalization are quite great. To what extent is that truly a shared um, issue for the United States and Mexico. Mexico's military is, is a professional military organization. Their involvement in the drug fight, how much does that put it at risk and how much is that of interest and part of the shared responsibility? Very much so. Well, I, you, I, I do not think it's something that you can um, just leave to the Mexicans, but I also think that it's a delicate place, sovereignty. What exactly can we do? I, I think that there is, uh, there is a lot that we can do. I disagree with Javier when he says that the uh, statement by the drug czar that the war on drugs is over shows some less commitment to fighting drugs. On the contrary, it is a recognition that the strategies of the last 20 years didn't work and that maybe it is time to really look at treatment, rehabilitation, other interventions that could Harm possibly co yeah. could, could reduce that demand. Yeah. So um, those, those areas on our side um, and technical assistance in, in, in ways that are welcomed by the other side um, to try to get the military out as quickly as possible. Your point is, is well taken, I think, that there's always a danger about uh, the military becoming corrupted when they become more involved in this fight. But that hardly seems to me to be, to me to be an argument to go back to a system of using the police, which we know were hopelessly corrupted right. uh, in this fight, to using them. Uh, uh, and, and I don't think that anybody sees a great danger of the Mexican military becoming the, the dominant force in the Mexican political scene. I would say that Mexico, and we have a responsibility too, but Mexico has a big responsibility to try to create 
a, an efficient, honest uh, police force as quickly as possible because I think it is a corrupting influence to keep the military in there and have all the money that the drug organizations have to corrupt them. And where that's going to hurt if we don't, if Mexico doesn't take the lead in doing something about it, it's going to hurt in the whole cooperation area. Right now, our intelligence and, and uh, law enforcement agencies have more confidence in the Mexican side that they're dealing with. And if that side gets corrupted or the, or the police part of Mexico doesn't uh, get improved, then there's going to be less cooperation in going after these organizations. And the U.S. Congress then will say, there shouldn't be any more, we'll go back to where we were. That's why I think it's, uh, I think it's very important that Mexico does its part. We have a big part to play in that. Susan, I, I'd like to make also, one very quick point, and Roderick can talk about this later. He knows more about it than any of us. But there are three issues, I think, that have to do with the military's involvement. The first, of course, is that it diffuses a bilateral issue which used to be a, a very serious bilateral issue, and that is the militarization of the border. Yep. Uh, today, the U.S. can send National Guard troops to the border, and the Mexicans won't say a word. Why? Because the Mexican military are at the border as well. So that's one issue. The second is your characterization of our military as a professional military is correct in the sense that it's an apolitical military. However, it is also a military that has never really been involved in combat as a military, as military units should be. And its combat experience today is limited to fighting drug trafficking. Uh, it is not prepared for that kind of combat experience. There are human rights issues involved, uh, as you've seen from the recent reports by Amnesty and by Human Rights Watch. But more importantly, within Mexico, there's a serious debate going on about whether the military should be out doing these things. Uh, after all, President Calderon was put into office thanks to the military in the sense that they were the ones who kept law and order in the days and hours of the actual handing over of the administration from President Fox to President Calderon. And since then, uh, the relationship between the political and the military has been increasingly close and increasingly evident. And that worries a lot of Mexicans who, for many years, felt that their military had to keep out of politics. Hmm. Phil, sir? Sydney, yes? Yeah, sir? Yeah, Sydney. 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 Yeah. Uh, my name is Sydney Weintraub. I'm at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm going to change the tone of the questions, because uh, I don't think the military is all that important in Mexico. Let me get to something. I think is important. Carlos Heredia uh, referred to it during his, his commentary. Mexico, in the last 25 years, has grown an average of about 2% a year, maybe 2.5% a year. In per capita terms, 1%, half of 1%. Uh, and the main reason, I think, for that is not trade. The market the United States is open. It's the inability of the Mexican political system to make structural changes that all Mexicans know have to get made. I'll give you a, some examples, if you want, on tax collections, on fiscal policy, uh, on monopolies and combat of monopolies, changing some of the labor laws, uh, educational structures, Energy. people not getting enough in the rural areas. I think those are the critical issues. The question I want to ask you, do you think all of your discussion would be irrelevant, and I think it would, if Mexico had been growing by 6% a year instead of 2% a year in the last 25 years? Sure. Yeah. Obviously. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you think the action then? Hey, Carlos. <sighs> okay. Um, the, the, the answer may seem obvious, but... Uh, if we go on like, like, we're, you know, like we're doing things in Mexico, we have had 6% growth for decades, you know, prior to 82. Prior to 82. But uh, we did not address the imbalances that you mentioned, tax collection, monopolies, uh, the steep inequality of income and wealth. Mm -hmm. So if we address 
those issues, and if we grow at 6%, then my answer would be yes. But only if we address those issues. And I am afraid that in this administration, the government is not prepared to take on the uh, union bosses, the monopolies, and to really make all of us Mexicans pay taxes. So the government is not prepared to do that. There's not the political will, there's not the decisiveness to establish a level playing field and the rule of law uh, equally for every Mexican. Some Mexicans are more equal than others. That's a provocative question. Others? Uh, yes, sir, you in the back there? Yes, you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mustafa Azizi. I'm from the Washington Center. Uh, just to kind of piggyback uh, on what this gentleman was saying, uh, my question to you, understanding that there might be a qualitative change between the U.S. and Mexico, I'm still counting the tally, um, what, what qualitative shifts do you uh, see necessary uh, in terms of Mexico's domestic policy in promoting the eradication of these problems we're talking about, in particular <laughs> drugs? Uh, through education funding and social reform without being influenced by corruption uh, through governmental cronyism? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that does open up a whole other area for us. Does anybody want to try to steer that question into the main discussion? I mean, the best example of governmental cronyism was uh, Carlos Salinas de Gortari making Miguel de la Madrid say that he didn't say what he said. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and declare him crazy. And then Miguel de la Madrid retorts saying, oh, no, 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 I'm not that crazy. I'm, you know, <laughs> surrealistic. Yeah. I think I, I just, I just want to throw something out. I've been struggling with this uh, issue for a while now. Um, the idea, you know, in the U.S., we don't have the social democrats of Europe. We don't have sort of, we really don't have a class consciousness. Not really. You, you had candidates who, who would run, um, and it just didn't gravitate, didn't get any traction, right? And I keep wondering, you know, you look at Mexico with its resources, and I keep wondering, why, doesn't, why didn't it become South Korea? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Got more people, got more resources, right? And I keep thinking that there's something about um, its history, its acceptance of an elite, of a sense that there that there is there's a class difference, and somehow perhaps just not unified enough to really see itself prepared to make the big you know we all have to pay taxes, we're all in it together. That kind of sort of we have corruption in the U.S. as well, right? And with the demise of journalism, who knows? It might might increase. We need those journalists. Print journalism. <laughs> Print journalism, right? <laughs> Thank you. Well, no, investigative reporting. But um, but but we have corruption, and we have a rule. We have a judicial system that some would question. But but nonetheless, there is this underlying belief that it's there's a unity there. That there is a system in which we all have a stake. And I just I want to throw that out as something that maybe is worth thinking about, or maybe not. No, but I, I, I go back to education. Um, the, when I was in Mexico and subsequently, I would go into particularly the southern part of Mexico where most of the 40% who are still living in poverty live. And I noticed they were very much like the folklore of my home state of Oklahoma after the Depression. Uh, what they wanted, the adults, what they recognized that perhaps their lives were not going to be as good as they had hoped, but they really wanted their children and grandchildren to have that opportunity. And that opportunity is closed to them. Only through education, massive amounts of quality education, uh, Asian type education that make them uh, ready to carry on jobs in the 21st century economy, I think is going to give them the kind of muscle, the kind of political power it takes to even up some of these discrepancies in the Mexican society. I think that's terribly important, but if you look at NAFTA, per capita incomes I think have tripled since NAFTA, and yet you have 40% still living in poverty, so it's all gone to the 60% who's done well. That, has, that gap has to close, and to me education is the, is the starting point.
I, I agree with uh, Ambassador Jones. I think education is, is the number one issue in Mexico which nobody has really fundamentally dealt with. And that includes not just the million plus teachers uh, that are underpaid and that spend their time demonstrating out in the streets for more pay, but also obviously includes the, the issue of, of, of the union and, and, and the fact that there have been all these fights against, you see, Mex Mexico's fundamental problem, and it goes to a lot of what Sydney said and others, is that there has not been a decision to hit against the vested interests. Mexico spent 70 years creating vested interests, and those vested interests today are still as powerful as they were when the opposition gained power in, in during the Fox administration, now the Calderon administration. And by the way, this also holds true not just for the PAN and the PRI, but I think it also holds true for the PRD. The vested interests, the monopolies that uh, Carlos Heredia was talking about, uh, I mean, you want to hear something really absurd? An airline in Mexico, a low-cost airline, was found the day before yesterday to be unworthy of flying because 25 of their planes have problems. The airline was shut down by the federal government. The airline took the case to a provincial judge in San Luis Potosí, who then gave them a habeas corpus to be able to continue to operate. And they are now operating. And the government is sitting there saying, it's unsafe to fly that airline, but the airline can continue to fly. Now this is, this is it sounds absurd. But this is a typical example of a, what I call a new democracy, a democracy which is worried about the balance of power between the federal and the state, between the legislative, the executive, and the judicial, and where it is unwilling to take the decisions that it needs to take. And I will f never forget when I talked to my American friends some years ago, 10, 15 years ago, we want democracy in Mexico. You've got to become more democratic. You've got to go to alternating power. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And we always said, fine, we will do it. But then forget about the old system that you were so comfortable with and start getting used to democracy the way it works in practice. And what we have today is chaos. It is democracy, but it is chaotic democracy. So what, what I'm hearing a little bit in this, in this last turn of the conversation is from a very optimistic opening. <laughs> We've arrived at total chaos. Uh, and, uh, and, but really, this question about whether or not they're self-limiting uh, aspects to both countries' realities that prevent a shared uh, sense of, of responsibility or strategy from developing seems to be very much on the table. Maybe we'll do one more question. Yes, ma'am. I'm Margaret Daly Hayes, and I've dealt with uh, U.S. Latin American issues in this town for longer than I want to admit, uh, <laughs> but some people know. Um, my question goes, we've, Maria raised the question of leadership. Carlos, you talked about the big idea. Um, but at the same time, you said, well, the government has to do it. Um, my question is, where is there leadership in Mexico, in the private sector, civil society, et cetera, um, that can bring this idea of a more modern, a more efficient Mexico that can operate more on a, in, a, in a peer relationship with the United States. And I worry that this doesn't exist because, again, in my experience, those countries that don't come with their own ideas to the United States and engage our private sector, think tanks, et, et cetera, in a discussion of what strategy we might pursue together, don't achieve, uh, don't get the kind of attention that they, in principle, in theory, deserve. And so where is the leadership? Where are the interlocutors that 
those of us who really care about this and our think tanks and, and so forth can engage for the long term, not just in writing a report which we can publish but then doesn't get the kind of follow-up, uh, et cetera, that it deserves. Thank you. I, I think that's one of the missing ingredients in Mexico. Um, one of my goals when I went there was to try to help create the conditions for real democracy, and the 1994 election was the first test. And after lots of give and take with President Salinas, we finally were able to get international observers. And we put money into developing NGOs to monitor elections, and et cetera. It was over, <coughs> and it was a close election, but it was clearly declared honest. I met with one of the heads of the NGOs that, um, that I had a great deal of confidence in, and, and congratulating him, et cetera, and, uh, and, he, and I said, what's next? And he said, well, I don't know what we should do next. Would you have any ideas? And I said, why don't you look at the, the common cause, John Gardner's common cause, and petition the Mexican legislature, uh, Congress. And this is a person who had been very upfront, out front, uh, considered a leader. He said, well, that would be useless. They would never listen to us. And I think that attitude that you cannot petition your government and, and have uh, an effect needs to be overcome, but that has to be done, I think, internally. And let me just turn that around, uh, if I could, and just ask about leadership on this side. Yeah. <laughs> what about, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, what about leadership over, we've been talking about Mexico, what about leadership so, over the so United where, States where, on these long-term problems that we're talking about? You know, maybe this will all become moot because the United States may just kind of gradually sink into a second-rate economic power as Mexico rises. We'll both be a, at approximately the, the same level. I, I don't know if you saw, I was really struck by the article this weekend, I think it was in the New York Times, about returning immigrants to uh, going back to Central America. And the guy uh, from Honduras who was moving back uh, because he didn't have a job, he'd been here 10 or 15 years, said, I think I'm going to take the savings I have. I'm going to open a little automo automobile repair shop in Honduras. That way my two sons who still live in New York will have a livelihood when they have to come home to Honduras. You know, what does that say? Not so much about Honduras as it does about the United States, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about leadership the United States for what? For I'm our own about long term? No, I, I think leadership in, in, in driving the relationship forward as well. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and last thought, Javier? I, I would say something different regarding the future leadership on where we're going. And, uh, there are, uh, according to Institute of International Education, there are 14,000 Mexican students in colleges and universities in the U.S. Uh, Mexicans from Mexico, either in college or in, in their graduate studies. Those are the leaders for the future of the Mexico relationship. And they are the ones who are going to come back to Mexico. They're going to run businesses, NGOs. They're going to be members of government. And they are the really ones who are going to understand how things work here in the U.S., how things work in Mexico. And, and it is our hope, I mean, in terms of uh, those uh, young people who are really uh, run the future. One of them to graduate from Stanford uh, this weekend, <laughs> your daughter, yes. Carlos, you know. Yeah. To, to answer your question on, on the leadership, uh, I, can, I can name four names, you know, right off the top of my head. On, on economic policy and competition, what, what Denise Dresser is doing, I think, is very important, even if you don't agree with her. Uh, on, on human rights, what Emilio Álvarez y Casa is doing in Mexico City, what Lidia Cacho has done, uh, are, are, is critical uh, to transform our political system. Um, on the media, what Carmen Aristegui, the work she's doing, is, is absolutely essential for the transformation of Mexican democracy. So the leadership is there. So, well, you might ask, what's next? And if you look at the agenda, you'll see a panel called, What's Next? Uh, so I, I, I want to thank this exceptional, exceptional panel. And thank you. And what's next is indeed.
Hello. Good afternoon. Yep. Okay. Last panel at the end of the day. Thank you. The last speaker. Thank you for uh, enduring will be listening by the, time. the very optimistic views of the Let's previous panel, and, and thank you, Phil, for the fact that we're inheriting uh, a very upbeat vision here as to what's going to happen. Actually, Susan was suggesting that we shift attention to the Middle East right now. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a happier thing. The only good news is I will not be asking anything regarding soccer. <laughs> Those no, of you who are right. pundits in that, no, in that regard will know that on Saturday the U.S. beat Honduras yeah. and Mexico was beaten by El Salvador. And that seems to be a trend. It wasn't only on Saturday. So again, we will not be touching on that, fortunately. <laughs> Um, the question we will be addressing uh, in this closing dialogue is, is where are we headed? Uh, how will the bilateral agenda, the bilateral commitments that have been discussed here evolve amid the, the many challenges and the many distractions on both sides? Uh, and in and, and addressing the what next, maybe we should focus a bit more. Uh, I, I think we've had a, a wonderful platform and backdrop with the previous two discussions, but why don't we focus on possibly the next three years. Uh, why the next three years? Uh, for a host of reasons. The Mexican electoral calendar is very clear. Midterm congressional elections in 27 days. Presidential election in 2012. Most likely, most likely, no absolute majority in Congress. Uh, a complex, to say the least, a complex partisan split uh, in the making and an environment that is not exactly prone to building consensus and coalitions and alliances. Uh, the U.S. calendar, the same, congressional elections next year, presidential election in 2012, huge number of domestic and international distractions uh, in the horizon. So again, hopefully again, we can, we can focus on, on the next three years to try to build up a what next in terms of the commitments and challenges on the bilateral agenda that we've been uh, discussing so far today. Let me start with a few questions to each and one, every one of you, and, and hopefully we can uh, maintain the, uh, the dialogue kind of uh, a format that we've had so far with, with relatively short answers so that we can go back and forth and take some questions at the end. Diana, if I may, uh, taking advantage of your, of your vantage point and, and your vision of what's happening globally, where does the U.S.-Mexico agenda go from here? What's promising, what's exciting that we have missed in, in the discussion so far? Uh, and in addition to that, interestingly, we didn't discuss immigration much over the past uh, couple of hours. Interestingly, so, so what's, what's happening there? Lazaro was telling me about uh, a, a recent summit on immigration that was uh, totally different to what happened in recent years in terms of what kind of leadership was there, who was represented, even the invocation came from an Ayman, right? So again, totally different ball game. What do we expect, what should we be expecting in that regard? The excitement does not lie in the immigration area. Mm -hmm. At the moment, the protectionist sentiments are producing, I think, some very negative. But there are two areas where I think that there's potential. And one is the Caltech corridor. It runs from just south of Tijuana up California to Vancouver. It is private communication, internet connectivity. That is private sector driven, and it is seeing the potential that this West Coast can give to us. The second is a growing awareness that we share the same climatic region and that if we don't address these problems of climate change regionally, we will continue to harm our hemisphere. So climate change. Okay. Susan, two things. One is uh, we had some discussion in terms of the uh, lack of any progress in terms of structural reforms that are fundamental. I said Sydney was right on, on the mark in terms of underscoring that. What kind of effect will that have on the bilateral agenda, number one? Number two, there's a growing concern in some circles in Mexico that Brazil has taken the lead uh, in the U.S. attention. What would you say is happening in that regard? And in general, how does Mexico play a role? What kind of strategic niche, if you like, does Mexico play 
or have in the next few years with regards to Latin America in the eyes of Washington? Well, first of all, um, I'm rather pessimistic about U.S. policy toward Latin America. I know everyone is very happy that the tone has changed and um, you know, everyone would much rather listen to and be friends with President Obama than President Bush. But look where we are now. I mean, I truly don't understand, as of now, what our Latin America policy is, or even if there is one, and I don't even know if they think there should be. First of all, the economic uh, implosion, or whatever you want to call it, the crisis, has created big problems because the U.S. message until then was, you know, free markets, free trade, um, you know, the private sector, etc. And what's happening in the United States besides an increase in protectionism, which we've we've all discussed, um, we we've, we've kind of talked about and 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 lamented the big role of government in Latin America in some cases in the past as being somewhat dysfunctional. Well, here we go, you know, uh, General Motors, every almost every sector you could think of. I am rather concerned that of the, about the growing role of the U.S. government in many of our major um, economic sectors. And, you know, we can, we can go on and on. Democracy, you know, there was a kind of a pro-democracy um, uh, policy, not forever. Clearly, there was the whole period when we backed um, dictators or military dictatorship, et cetera. Well, the United States in this administration seems to have backed off considerably on support for democracy and, in fact, seems to be spending much more time on the Venezuelas and Cubas than on our democratic friends. Now, you, you mentioned, Raul, you know, that there's, there might be concern in Mexico that Brazil is getting more attention. Well, I don't know. What is, maybe in rhetorically, but what exactly is this great new Brazil policy that we're going to cooperate on alternative energy? I mean, how far is that going to get us in terms of a really profound relationship with Brazil, cooperating on developing alternative energy in Central America, the Caribbean, or even somewhere else? Now, the U.S.-Mexican relationship is much more impo important. Right now, it seems to be dominated by security issues for reasons that, that we all know. And here again, I think it's really problematic what I don't see coming out of both the United States and Mexico, which has to do with coming to grips with the, economic, the impact of this economic crisis on the economies not only of Mexico and the United States, but Canada as well. I mean, the U.S.-Mexican relation, first of all, we, Mexico, we used to import a lot of energy. Okay, so Mexico hasn't been... Um, a, uh, producing it's it's been decreasing with energy and I in the interest of disclosure like Roger I'm on the board of a refining company um, but what's happening I think both our governments are highly dysfunctional in terms of what their energy policy is I think we all should be looking at everything and we're not um, the Mexicans aren't investing enough and don't have the right rules of the game in order to increase investment in their oil industry etc Obama won't look at nuclear energy for example, won't look at drilling offshore. If the Brazilians had followed our energy policy in terms of offshore drilling, forget Tupi. They never would have found it. They would never be in line to be the next um, Saudi Arabia. And so, I mean, I can go on and on, but I think that a the impact of this crisis has been very yeah. bad for the economy of the United States. I don't know where our economy is going. I don't have confidence that the stock market, the recent rise in the stock market is going to stay because we haven't changed the structure. We cannot, I mean, President Obama can say, start buying, start buying. We can't go back to where we were. We have to restructure our economy. And I've seen very little other than to increase the role of the state. So that lays it out pretty starkly. But I'm very pessimistic because I don't see the necessary coming to grips, both in Mexico and the United States, with the changed economic situation. <clears throat> and I, the last thing I'll add is, you know, we always talked about one of the problems of Latin America, the reason it doesn't develop is that they don't have stable rules of the game in terms of investment. Well, folks, neither does the United States. I mean, when you bail out General Motors and you ignore the preferred shareholders and you give the, the lion's share to the labor unions, I mean, what are we talking about here? Rosanna, Mexico hasn't changed its structures either from an economic standpoint. You just wrote a, a report on, on the energy debate for Wilson. 
in Mexico with uh, what I would say is the perfect subtitle, Pozo de Pasiones. Um, how do you see that lack of progress on structural reforms affecting our ability to build a more positive bilateral agenda? Thank you. First, uh, Sydney, I did pay my taxes. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> Last week, I was sent by email the, the proof that I paid my taxes. And um, structural changes are always uh, a good excuse to say that uh, there's very little we can do in, 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 in the sense of um, really making a difference. It's hard to listen to my generation, Javier, saying that, it, that uh, it's not no longer our, our responsibility, that it's uh, somebody else's responsibility, the young generation next. I don't know how many of the 14,000 students here are going back to Mexico under the current situation and taking on public or private jobs in, in <coughs> Mexico. But as I don't uh, shy from um, controversial approaches uh, and, and opinions, let me share with you the idea that yes, uh, it was not what uh, we all expected. The, the, it, it's a very tepid reaction to the oil I don't want to call it reform because it's mm -hmm. the oil patch. Uh, the discussion, at least, uh, was had a, a different benefit than what is there, which is sometimes more cathartic. It it began the discussion, which was something that you did not discuss. Now uh, I think that um, in a structural things that we can really do differently. I want to throw something that I think that, uh, I don't see any arm personnel here, but I think that uh, while, while I was listening to everybody discussing about the army, and Sigrid is here, why don't we just change the name and go back to Romeo and Juliet and say, forsake thy name, and for that name, which is no part of you, have all of me. Costa Rica doesn't have an army. We need a police. Yes, we need a police. But the army is what we have now. Now, those are symbols, big symbols. The, we're not going to change the oil situation. You're not going to change the Second Amendment situation here. Maybe we can do something on the radical side that is along the lines of something that would be long-lasting, like really thinking about a national guard of sorts. I don't think that we need to have an army to fight who? Guatemala? The problem is that they might even... <laughs> <laughs> they might win. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is... I'm suggesting might win. We, no. we have what we have. And let me, uh, along the line of... Um, have I awakened you already? Because we were joking about being the last uh, panel and and, and having this um, audience that has already <coughs> been very uh, well fed in thoughts. Why are we not thinking about the health issue? Roger, you've heard time and again that I address this. After the H1N1, maybe the only thing that is really a, the good part of it is that we learn to wash watch our uh, to wash our hands more and better and in this country you had mary where's uh, the the irish woman mary the the typhoid uh, who was typhoid mary in the turn of the 19th to 20th century and that made a difference that um, you decided that uh, people at restaurants, when you go into a restroom, you have these little messages saying, watch your hands. That's a good opportunity if you want to sit on the optimistic uh, side of life, because we're, watching, we're washing our hands better and more frequently. And the Hospital Inglés, where Diana sits, the ABC, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has just 
been given the certification, um, the international certification, which means that you, you can go and, and have surgery, knee surgery, for exactly who, who was saying a third of uh, the cost of what you would pay here. And one of the factors was that uh, the personnel was, had less inf was passing around less infections. So that's a, the good side. Um, now, the bad side, the bad side of um, the new new is that if symbols are important, and they are important, what tells you if this administration, which we know that Susan is not thinking very highly of, is naming an ambassador whose speciality is failed state. And finally, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I remember distinctly visiting your town, Jim, and seeing an exhibit that was sent by a, a Mexican rich man, very rich man, that has his collection outside of Mexico, which is not infrequent, to say the least. But convergence among our, our countries should be really something that we look forward to. And I think that that, um, that, uh, that collection, in any case, should be at least sent to a Mexican museum so that we can also benefit from the aesthetics of, and watch it there. But uh, convergence with whom? I, I was yesterday going around and, and watching the homeless in DC. And the convergence in your own society, Maria, is something that is still an open question. Yes, we need to converge more, far more. But um, make it, making it more equ equal within our societies. I'm not saying, I'm not defending Mr. Slim, he has a lot of defendants wi within the audience and outside of the audience. He doesn't need my, <coughs> my argumentation for him, but I don't take it uh, well when uh, Wolfowitz comes into our country and says, how dare you accept uh, that uh, you have the second richest man on the earth and 40 million poor people you have in this society a very well-established idea that you're a very equal society. I don't think that that is the case. Diana. I, I want to make an interjection. On Thursday night, the president nominated Carlos Pascual to be our next ambassador to Mexico. I work with him. Carlos is one of the most intelligent men I know and now heads up foreign policy at Brookings Institution. To characterize him as having been a man of failed states is wrong. To characterize him as looking as how you create the government, the multilateral government institutions, UN multilateral funding, to address the problems may be right. We are sending you one of our brightest, not a fail. Roderick, by acclamation, you need to follow up on the military. <laughs> uh, but in addition to that, after you, you deal with that, uh, can, can you address uh, how, do we, how do we aterrizar, as we say in Spanish? How, do you, how, do we, how does this set of ideas and policies and commitments trickle down if you have an issue with structures and mechanisms and procedures that are still there and won't go away? So the two things, so first military, second, you know, how do you implement change? <clears throat> well, I guess in terms of the military, I would just add a couple of comments. One, the, that the military role actually in Mexico goes back to the 1940s. This is not a recent role. It's the intensity of the role which has changed. And the intensity of that role actually goes back to the Zedillo administration, not the Fox administration or the called the Rhone administration. When the military itself made the decision in 1995 that it would willingly undertake that role in carrying out the tasks which the presidency assigned it in terms of 
the drug interdiction task going beyond the task which had characterized its mission in that area for some <clears throat> 40 years previously as one of largely destroying the growth of uh, drug-related crops to one of not only interdicting the transportation of those drugs but also uh, locating drug dealers and capturing drug dealers. So this has a longer history than we have uh, suggested. As far as the issue of the military uh, being able to be eliminated in terms of performing that mission, I, I would agree with the comments that were made. In my opinion, there's no likelihood that the mil military will be taken out of that task given the slowness of transferring that task to a civilian force. And I also would remind you that at least in, in my lifetime examining Mexico, I can remember every single administration beginning